clowns. Nobody likes them. I mean, we had the Great Clown Invasion back in 2016 for a reason. Creepy clown sightings. Creepy clowns. It's a phenomenon sweeping the country right now. An elementary school on alert after parents reported seeing two clowns just lurking around the campus. Dude, what? Oh my god! Though in this video, we're not talking about just any clown. We are talking about one in particular who had killed 33 individuals, all consisting of younger boys within only a few years. The story of John Wayne Gacy, aka the killer clown, is disturbing, vile, and much more complex than you might think. John Wayne Gacy was born on March 17, 1942, in Chicago, Illinois. Growing up, Gacy had strong relationships with his mother and two sisters. But his father, well, that's a different story. His father constantly physically and emotionally abused him throughout his childhood. He was an alcoholic who downplayed and belittled anything Gacy did. He'd always insult young Gacy and call him things like sissy and stoopy whoopy doopy dookie head. Oh, okay, I made that last one up, but point is, despite all of this, Gacy still loved his father, which led to an overarching feeling of him just not being enough. Now, before we move on, some things just need to be mentioned. When Gacy was around seven years old, he was repeatedly molested by the teenage daughter of one of his mother's friends. Unfortunately, this wasn't all. Not long after this happened, a contractor in his 30s who had a casual friendship with Gacy's father began taking Gacy out to get ice cream, though of course that's not what actually happened. Gacy soon asked his father not to leave him with the contractor again, and to my knowledge, they never saw each other after that. Sadly, in fear of getting beaten, or worse, Gacy could never tell his father what had happened. Skipping ahead, Gacy, whilst in the middle of his high school years, decided to drop out, and once he turned 18, he started getting a little more involved with politics in his area even becoming assistant precinct captain for a candidate in his local area. Two years later, in 1962, Gacy drove to Las Vegas in hopes of escaping his father's never-ending torment. Eventually, he landed a job as a mortuary attendant, where he'd observe actual morticians do the whole embalming processes on dead bodies. One night, while nobody was around, Gacy snuck into an already occupied coffin of a deceased teenage boy. He then started doing things to it before he abruptly stopped himself. Gacy was apparently shocked by what he had just done, so he decided to leave and head back to his hometown. 1964 Gacy found himself a stable job working as a shoe salesman meeting his soon-to-be wife, Marlon Myers. Soon after they started dating, Gacy joined the local JCs group, an organization that basically covers community service and leadership related activities in whatever area they're based in. One night, a fellow member in the organization invited Gacy out for drinks at his place. Gacy agreed to meet the guy, they got drunk, and well, let's just say the Gluck Gluck 9000 was performed that night. And yeah, he was still dating Marlon Myers, who he was also engaged to at the time. You're probably thinking, so what, he was just some cheater at this point? No, I, I mean, yeah, but despite that, Gacy knew this whole time that he was, well, Gacy. Nonetheless, in September of 1964, Gacy and Myers married. Gacy was soon offered to become manager of one of the KFC locations his father-in-law owned in Waterloo, Iowa. He accepted the offer and both Gacy and Myers moved to Waterloo. Gacy was making roughly 15 k a year, which today is basically $150,000. He was seemingly at the happiest point in his life, according to him. His father apologized for how he treated him his whole life after seeing how successful he became, and both Gacy and Myers had two children in the following years. Though everything would soon change, and things would start to get much darker.
Gacy opened a little area in the basement of the KFC he managed. The room was for his employees to have fun, drink alcohol, and play pool. Now keep in mind, Gacy was hiring teenagers, and while that's not exactly uncommon, he often interacted with the younger guys where he'd try to do things to them. When he was directly denied by someone he made advances on, Gacy came up with some excuse on the spot. In late 1967, Gacy lured a 15-year-old boy to his house with the promise of letting him watch adult movies. He encouraged the kid to drink alcohol before doing disgusting things to him. This wasn't the only kid, however, as around this time, Gacy had abused many others under the guise of conducting gay experiments. And that 15-year-old boy I just told you about? Well, he was the son of a local politician, Donald Voorhees. A few months later, the boy told his father what had happened and police were immediately called. Gacy claimed he was innocent, even taking a polygraph test which also called him a liar. Though after this didn't work, he had to come up with another plan. So Gacy paid one of his KFC employees $300 to beat up the 15 year old boy in an attempt to scare him away from testifying in court. And it happened. Well, just the beating up part. Police were soon called and the employee paid to do the act confessed to being hired by Gacy. With that, Gacy was now also charged with hiring the employee to assault and intimidate the young boy. Later that year, Gacy pled guilty to the original charges of, well, let's just say, doing inappropriate and disgusting things to a minor, ultimately being sentenced to 10 years in prison. Around this time, Marlon Myers, Gacy's wife, filed for divorce and took the kids, house, and alimony. Gacy never saw any of them ever again. Shockingly, his time spent in prison would be much shorter than you'd think. He spent less than two years locked up before being granted parole for outstanding behavior. While incarcerated between 1968 and 1970, Gacy improved pay rates for fellow prisoners, cooked meals, and basically improved the lives of those living there. And on Christmas of 1969, Gacy received word that his father had passed away. In 1970, Gacy was granted parole with 12 months of probation, under the conditions of moving back to Chicago, living with his mother, and following a curfew of 10 p.m. Months later, in February of 1971, Gacy lured a teenage boy into his house and tried to R-word him. The boy escaped, running to the nearest police station. Gacy was initially charged, but when the boy failed to show up to court, the charges were ultimately dropped. Gacy had just violated his parole, but somehow his parole officer never heard of what happened. And soon, on October 18th of that year, Gacy's parole ended. Gacy soon bought a home on the northwest side of Chicago, 8213 West Summerdale Avenue. Gacy's final home, where he'd commit the rest of his crimes for years to come. Not long after moving into the house, Gacy began dating Carol Hoff, who was someone he knew and even dated back in high school. They got engaged relatively quickly and married in less than a year. Hoff and her two daughters from a previous marriage soon moved into the house. Gacy's mother moved out not long after this. On top of all of these big changes in his life, Gacy started his own construction business under the name of PDM Contractors. It would start out as a humble little side project where he renovated, remodeled, and did some interior design for clients. As the years went on, it grew to tackle larger projects and clients earning the company well over six figures annually. People around Gacy thought highly of him and he had a kind of reputation in his area of being a stand-up guy who helped the community. Though behind the curtain of PDM, Gacy would harass and take advantage of his employees who were either high school students or young adults. There are multiple well-reported instances of Gacy manipulating, threatening, and raping his employees. 
One of his employees, David Cram, was able to fight back. At just 18 years old, Cram was hired and actually moved in with Gacy just a month later. The two were drinking one night when Gacy tricked Cram into handcuffs before telling him he was going to you-know-what him. Cram kicked Gacy right in the face before freeing himself and escaping, though he never moved out. One month later, Gacy knocked on Cram's bedroom door, stating, Dave, you really don't know who I am. Maybe it would be good if you give me what I want. Cram resisted any attempts Gacy made to get him, and after a few minutes, Gacy gave up, stating, You ain't no fun. Before we move on to the murders and everything that came after, we gotta talk about the clown thing. It all started in 1975 when Gacy became aware of the Jolly Joker Clown Club. Members of this club often performed around town as clowns, whether it be for fundraising or helping hospitalized children laugh. It's important to remember society back then didn't really have any issue with clowns, as most people didn't see them scary, disturbing, or anything else you might attribute to clowns today. They were goofy people that almost everyone classified as just being entertainment. Casey joined the club, soon coming up with the idea of Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown. As you can tell, both were distinctly different from each other. Pogo was meant to be a happier clown, with Patches being the reserved and more serious one of the two. Gacy began performing at events as either of the two, depending on the situation. Charities, hospitals, birthday parties, whatever it was, Gacy was up to the task. He wasn't making much money from performing as a clown, but he still had his reasons for doing so. He himself later stated that he did it to, quote, regress into childhood. While that may be the case, considering his very traumatic childhood, it also may have allowed him to get away with doing his tricks that he'd perform on his murder victims. The clowning was relaxation for me. I enjoyed entertaining kids. Like some people are, uh, you know, they, they unwind in different ways, either, either we're going out drinking or that. I could put on clown makeup and I was relaxed. His M.O. was typically to get his victim drunk or intoxicated in some manner, making them less on edge and more trusting. Casey would then pull out handcuffs, offering to show the victim a magic trick that he himself would do first. After he'd cuff and free himself, he tells the victim to try it. Once the cuffs were on them and they were restrained, Gacy would add cuffs to their ankles before proceeding to assault, rape, and torture the victim. Afterwards, he'd strangle the victim with a rope, stating, this is the last trick. He also called it the rope trick. Gacy then typically put them under his bed for a day or two before burying them in his crawl space. It was January 2nd of 1972, the day after New Year's, where Timothy McCoy, a 16-year-old boy, hey that rhymed, was about to fall asleep waiting for a bus that wouldn't arrive for a while. John Wayne Gacy would be in the area and slowly approach Timothy, asking if he wanted a ride and even a place to sleep. Timothy agreed, and the two were soon on their way to Gacy's house. According to Gacy, he woke up the next morning to Timothy standing in the bedroom doorway holding a knife. Gacy noticed, and thinking the kid was going to kill him, he charged at Timothy before taking the knife and repeatedly stabbing him until he died. As Gacy left the bedroom, he saw breakfast was prepared on the kitchen table. It then hit him that Timothy never intended on harming him. He just happened to be holding the knife he had just used in the kitchen. Though Gacy wasn't upset or disturbed in any way after what he had just done. If anything, according to him, he was, uh, stimulated. He then buried Timothy in the crawlspace under his home. One day in the summer of 1975, Gacy invited John Butkovich to his home to talk. Butkovich was 18 years old and an employee of PDM, Gacy's company. They had been having disputes about his pay, so when Gacy invited Butkovich to his house to talk about it, he agreed, thinking not much of it. Gacy gave him alcohol, showed him the rope trick, and well, strangled him, before burying him in the crawl space. With Butkovich now missing and his parents having heard of the pay dispute with his boss, Gacy, they told police about him. 
When questioned, Gacy made up a story about Butkovich leaving his house with a friend after coming to an agreement on the pay. This was somehow enough for the police, and Gacy was free from suspicion not long after. But Butkovich's parents weren't happy. They suspected something was off about him, pleading with police to investigate Gacy further. Sadly, nothing would end up happening. Gacy and his second wife, Carol Hoff, ended up getting a divorce in late 1975. He was just spending way less time with Hoff and more time with guys he'd be boning. Hoff knew he was cheating and they mutually split up. Gacy now had more time to spend doing what he did, and it showed. Between 1976 and 1978, Gacy went on a spree, relatively speaking. Most of the murders he committed occurred during these two years, and most had no clue of who John Wayne Gacy truly was. Though that would all change after the disappearance of one boy. On December 11th of 1978, Gacy walked into a pharmacy hoping to talk to the owner about a potential remodeling. A 15-year-old boy, Robert Peast, was working that day as it was his part-time job while attending school. Gacy took notice of Peast and asked if he wanted to work for him instead, adding in the fact that he paid much more than his current job. Gacy gave the kid his address, telling him to swing by if he wanted to talk more. He then left the store. It was soon getting late, and Peast's mother arrived to pick him up, though he declined a ride home, telling his mom that he had to talk to a man about a potential construction job. He told her he'd be back quickly and left. When Peast got to Gacy's home, he was given a soda before they briefly talked about employment and pay. Not long after, Gacy tricked Peast into handcuffs before doing what he had done to the rest of his previous victims. Peast's family was now extremely worried as it had been hours and their son was nowhere to be found. They contacted police who talked to the pharmacy owner, asking him if he knew who this mysterious contractor was that Peast told his mother he was going to meet. The store owner immediately knew it was most likely Gacy, as they had literally just discussed the potential remodeling. Police started to look into Gacy, and while searching through his background and criminal history, they discovered his past arrest and conviction involving minors. Immediately, they had a prime suspect. Police asked Gacy to come to the station to talk, which he eventually did, though he denied everything, saying he knew nothing about offering a job. Later, police obtained a search warrant and looked through Gacy's house, thinking Peast was still alive. They found nothing that incriminating, so they left and continued surveillance on Gacy. Detectives started interviewing people from his past, like David Cram, the parents of John Butkovich, and many others who had very negative feelings towards Gacy or flat out accused him of heinous things in the past that were overlooked. After talking to previous roommates of Gacy's, they started putting pieces together that the crawl space was somewhere they needed to thoroughly investigate. On December 21st, police with a new warrant dug up the crawlspace and found everything. Layers and layers of bones and remains that finally shined a light on the disgusting and disturbed man that was John Wayne Gacy. The next day, Gacy confessed to everything, going into depth on each individual victim. By 1980, Gacy was charged and eventually found guilty of 33 murders and the sexual assault of Robert Peast. Gacy was given the death penalty for his crimes. He spent 14 years on death row before his execution on May 10th of 1994. His last meal was a bucket of KFC fried chicken, shrimp, fries, strawberries, and a Diet Coke. Ugh. His alleged final words were, kiss my ass. Fitting, right? After his execution, Gacy's brain was removed and given to Helen Morrison, a forensic psychiatrist who wanted to study his brain for common abnormalities with others like him. Unfortunately, there are still five unidentified victims of Gacy who were found buried on his property. Some people, including investigators to this day, believe Gacy may have had more victims. 
though this hasn't been confirmed to be true. There might also be room to suggest that Gacy wasn't acting alone in every single one of these murders. A few of Gacy's employees at PDM apparently had keys to his home. And according to a couple lawyers in Chicago, in 2012 while they were looking through travel records, they noticed that Gacy wasn't in Chicago at the time of three of his murders. Again, none of this is confirmed, but it does put everything into question. Was Gacy acting alone, or were there others who helped commit these vile acts that might still be out there? In the end, John Wayne Gacy murdered over 30 individuals with no remorse, and he will forever be known as one of the world's worst and most infamous serial killers.